Hi, it's Steve, and I am here with Pritish Vora. Pritish, Hello, thank Steve. you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome. It's my pleasure. Let's start off our discussion this way. I am referring to you as a freedom fighter. Do you consider yourself a freedom fighter? Well, yes, because I believe right now we're in a situation where our freedoms are at stake. And, um, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country from India. And, uh, you know, my parents lived in the British, under British rule uh, until Indian independence. They came here as, as Indians, became American citizens. So I've always believed in, you know, truth and justice and freedom. And uh, I just felt this whole COVID thing that our freedoms were being, you know, it's basically like you're taken away from us. So, um, but I, I consider myself more of a truth finder. I've always been passionate about finding truth. And um, so that's where I come from. Uh, you know, uh, I always like to scrutinize and, and I'm very analytical. So if something is said, I don't just take it at face value. I do my research and I investigate. And so that's where I come from. So you've always been a truth finder? I mean, yeah, I've always like, in other words, if I see something that I don't think is, is right, I'll speak up. You know, I'll, 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 I'll say my piece. You know, I'll say what I think is wrong about a certain situation. I've always been like that. You know, even I remember you know, from high school when we had an uh, open lunch and all of a sudden they took that away from us and, and a group of us organized, you know, a rally saying, hey, we should be able to go out during lunch and just small things like that. It's just over the course of my, uh, you know, of my upbringing, I've always been a critical thinker. And uh, so that's where I come from. Were you um, an advocate for, so you were an advocate for freedom even back then. You're, you're talking about the use of your critical thinking skills. But like in that case you just mentioned, it was, um, you were speaking out ag against an infringement of your freedom. Correct. So, so has freedom been something that you have frequently spoken out for? Well, I think not as much as since we've seen during this whole COVID thing. Um, I think we take freedoms for granted, you know, because we live in a free country, the land of the free, home of the brave. So we believe that we have uh, these God-given rights. And then when we see them taken away is when we really understand what they really mean, you know, when we don't have them. And um, so I think it's very important to always recognize that we have to always, you know, uh, understand what freedoms, uh, how valuable they are and how they can be easily taken away you know, by people who claim they have power or authority over us. So like with these mandates, you know, when people just said, you have to do this, you have to wear a mask, you have to take a test, you have to get a shot. And we saw how that can be easily eroded. So I think it's important to, to, uh, to speak out if, that, if you see that happening, you know, in, in all aspects of life, not just with the COVID things, but um, so that's where, that's my position. Is there a downside to speaking out? Is there, does it create problems for you? Well, here's what happens. So, <clears throat> you know, everyone has their own opinions, but not everyone I think is willing to take the time to review the facts. So you can be in a situation where uh, you may have the information and you may present it to someone, but if they're not willing to look at it, then it creates a conflict. And so that means that may create disruptions in relationships. And then you really get to see who your real friends are because your friends are the ones that are going to listen to you and be open-minded enough to share ideas without criticizing you. Um, and then you'll, you'll realize who you can speak to on a superficial level and who you can speak to on a more deeper level. And I think this whole pandemic has taught a lot of people that. Have you lost friends? Um, I would, yeah, I would say what, when I say lost friends, I would say that um, I think people have become more distant, um, especially when you realize how difference of opinions can create rifts uh, with things like mandates and, and, you know, mass and things like that. So I think if people aren't willing to really look into the situation as you 
are willing to do, then they kind of distance themselves. So it creates rifts in families and friendships. But I have a very close knit uh, friend of, you know, small group of friends that we can talk openly and, and, and something like this is not gonna cause any type of disruption. But you really, you really realize how uh, superficial some of your friends are and you know, uh, how deep your friends are depending on what you're able you know, to actually communicate with them. Are you finding, you're talking about the difference between superficial relationships and deep relationships. Um, have you found that it's really a matter of a difference of opinion or are there deeper emotional and psychological issues related to people who have no tolerance for people that demand thinking? I mean, is there, do you pay any attention to the mass formation psychosis type theories? Do you see people around you close to you um, as being a little bit out of their mind, so to speak? I think a lot of that has to, this mass formation you're talking about has to do with um, status and who they think is an authority figure. So for example, if people routinely watch the mainstream news and they believe in that, those authority figures as conveying information to them, then that's their belief system. So even if people they know who are their friends, their family members, their well-wishers tell them things that conflict with that, they may not be as open to listening or accepting because it's not the person who they think is the one that has the status or authority. So I think that's, that's an issue we face. Would you call that a, like a blind obedience to authority? Yes, I would, I would call, I would, I would agree with that. Yes. Um, so, Especially when things are narrated over and over and over again, right? It becomes part of their, their belief system. And, you know, as we discussed on our earlier call, it's very difficult to change that once they've, uh, once they adapt that, you know, once they adapt that type of belief system, it's very difficult to change. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with ego too, right? Because when people are confronted with truth, they either have really three different uh, responses. Either they are willing to accept and discuss things, even if you have differences of opinions, or they get very defensive, or they just don't want to talk about it. They'll switch the subject. They'll say, hey, let's not talk about that, you know, uh, because you're basically challenging their belief system. And they may have a certain belief system they don't want to change. So they're kind of like trapped in the matrix. And you're showing them a way out but they don't want to leave the matrix, right? To escape the matrix is to see it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? So that's, that's I think was what, uh, you know, how people defer in their belief systems. How do you see fear as being linked to this? Are they, would you characterize them as being fearful, paralyzed by fear or yeah, is fear, fear is not fitting to, into this? Yeah, so fear is false evidence appearing real. So when people are consumed by fear, they're paralyzed, right? They can't make a judgment because they're controlled by fear, right? As we saw in this whole beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, people were really consumed by fear and they're fearful to even leave their house, right? To go see their friends. Uh, you know, I know people in, in the Indian community where you know, uh, grandparents wouldn't be allowed to see their grandchildren because their adult parents were, fear were fearful, you know. So I think, yes, I think people can be definitely consumed and paralyzed by fear, which prevents them from taking action. I think the, uh, this whole COVID narrative uh, did a great job of keeping people in fear, which prevented the pushback from being as strong as it would have been. If people didn't have that 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 perspective and yet here you are i mean so what does that say about you do you feel fear or do you do you not feel fear how do you deal with how do you deal with fear well i think everyone has uh, some sense of fear but i think you have to put everything in perspective you know what is this fear you know uh i read a, i do a lot of reading so i do a lot of you know investigative research and i found early on that there were articles that were talking about 
the so-called virus has a 99.98% survival rate. So what's that real fear, right? What's the fear about? You know, it just didn't make sense to me. So, um, you know, I think I think people were generally fearful, but I think that's a lot of a lot of that was media driven. It wasn't real, right? It was just fear because of what they were told, and not what they really saw or experienced. So that's you know that's where the, the fear comes in, and if there's is if there's a politically motivated agenda, then I think the fear becomes uh, more, you know, more defined. More defined in terms of if well, they... there's someone's trying to sell you something, right? Someone's trying to sell you a narrative through fear, and you're and you're react, and just you're basically reacting to that. So the is the problem, and now are they afraid of getting in trouble? Are they afraid of getting prosecuted? I mean, once it becomes a politically generated fear, it's no longer irrational. They're, they're kind of thinking, if I, if I disobey the authority, I'm going to get in trouble. They'll close my business or something to that effect. Do you see that that's, operative? Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah, I think a lot of people did what they were told because they had a fear of, uh, you know, uh, getting in trouble with the authorities or whatever, you know, because you know, everything revolves around livelihood and money, right? Everyone needs to make money to live. And so uh, people just blindly obeyed because they were fearful of their job, right? A lot of people complied, I think, reluctantly with the mandates because they were told, hey, if you don't take this, it's no job, no job, no, no jab, no job policy. And I think that fear was very real. I saw it with, you know, my friends who were told, you know, there's a vaccine mandate, you have to take the shot um, or, you know, quit or have, an, have a way to uh, address it through like a religious exemption. I helped one of my friends who worked for a tech company to get his religious exemption granted by helping him write, um, you know, uh, a notice to his employer. So, but yeah, there's obviously genu uh, there's a, a genuine fear of, 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 uh, of not obeying, especially if you have your livelihood on the line. You know, I'm an independent insurance agent, so I don't, I didn't have that, but I saw that with a lot of my friends who uh, were uh, compelled, right, through, through a mandate. So it affects people all around you, can't, can't avoid it. So you're persevering and in, uh, in when the world around you is, is fearful, do you, in your life, do you have any resources, any support systems that keep you strong and persevere? Uh, I have, a, like I said, very close to friends that um, think the same way I do. So it keeps us together, you know, it keeps our thinking power, the collective thinking power. And that really helps um, a good, good family support structure, um, you know, and uh, I think it just, having open discussions really helps to yeah. overcome that, you know, to overcome that. And, uh, you know, there's two paths I see. You just, you take the, uh, you ascend in truth, you're on the spiritual path, right? If you entertain deception, you're going to be on the path of deceit. And there's always people going to try to deceive you, right? And I was having a conversation with an Air Force officer a few months back, and I said, look, it's like a, just think of it like a vampire, you know, everybody knows what a vampire is. They, you have to get your, they have to get your permission to let them in. If you let them in, they're going to suck your blood and drain the life out of you. You know, hypothetically speaking, obviously, you know, talking just, uh, uh, but if you say no, you know, I, I'm not going to let you do that. Then you're refusing the offer to contract. And I believe everything's a contract. As I spoke to Ron the first time. I said, this is all about contracts. We're contracting, right? We're, we're insurance agents, so we understand contracts. We understand rescission of contracts. Everything's voluntary. It's by your consent. So if you consent to contracting, then if it's that other person has a nefarious agenda, you can be deceived. And I think that's what that's what happened during this whole pandemic. It's by voluntary consent. Yeah. So, and if you consent, then you know, then you've contracted. Yeah. In fact, I even got a text from someone who showed me the 
uh, the CVS uh, disclaimer saying if you are coming in to get your child the shot, the COVID shot, that you took all responsibility for anything that happened to your child because your child can't contract, they're minor. So the parent has to contract. So I saw the way it was written. I'm like, wow, this is kind of one-sided. Like you're taking all the risk for your child and uh, you know, the pharmacist has no liability because you're consenting, right? That's why the EUA fact sheet, the emergency use authorization clearly says you're being, you're, uh, this is an offer. You're being made an offer to take the product. And if you look further down, it says you have the option to accept or to refuse. That's it. Doesn't say if you refuse, you can't keep your job or for the military, you can't, you know, uh, stay in the military. Or if you're a doctor and you can't work in the hospital, it's not what it says. It's just you have the option to accept or to refuse. It's an offer to contract. That's all it is. And, you know, I think uh, people should, I think, really understand that concept more of offer and acceptance, which in the insurance world, that's all it is, right? The, the client signs a binding contract, which I have to sign as well. We submit it to the to the agency goes to Medicare, you know, I do Medicare and I have to provide full and fair disclosure, right? Cause I'm licensed. So in my business, I have to provide full and fair disclosure to people. Well, how come with these mandates and things, people were not given full and fair disclosure. There was a failure to disclose material and relevant facts to people. And so that's why I got involved in, 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 filing amicus curiae briefs, which is friend of the court briefs uh, in support of the military uh, plaintiffs because they were basically just saying, look, we, we're not gonna take this product. Not that we wanna you know, defy a lawful order, but it's not licensed. And we don't have to take a product that's not licensed, it's voluntary. But there was an agenda, right? That was over and above them that was in place. And so it was very difficult to fight that. That's very interesting. Tell us what started you initially in working with the military. How did so it happen? I, yeah, so, so um, well, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. Anything I say about these cases or any filings is not, it's just my personal opinion. It cannot be you know, construed as legal advice. But I, um, as a pro se, meaning appearing on my own, I had uh, filed a lawsuit against the credit bureaus many years ago in Orange County, California. And um, I did it on my own as a pro se without representation. And the um, in Orange County, the federal court has a pro se clinic for people like myself who are unskilled in law and don't really know how to do legal filings. They guide you, these lawyers that work there for free and give their time and allow you to sort of pick their brains and ask questions. And so I did that for a year when I was fighting the credit bureaus for uh, information that was not accurate on my credit report that I couldn't I couldn't get rid of for a year, and it was affecting my ability to you know uh, to get a car lease. So anyway, so that that really helped me because they were um, giving me guidance as to how the federal courts work in terms of the rules. So the federal courts are you know very strict, right? You have to have respect for the court, for the judge, but more importantly the rules, and so. Um, I had experience doing that. And when I saw these, these cases, I was, I was wondering why the, the courts were saying that, well, the military plaintiffs don't have standing because there's a licensed product, which I knew there, there wasn't because I'd done my research. And so I reached out to Todd Callender, who was attorney who filed a case uh, in Colorado, uh, it's called Robert B. Austin. And I had reached out to Ron on the same day because he had filed a case in New York regarding the vaccine passport in New York that the mayor had established. And so I didn't, I didn't know these people. I didn't know them. I just sent them a quick email saying, look, I, I've been following your cases and there seems to be uh, a discrepancy here because these judges are thinking these products are licensed, but there is no licensed product. I have some information. Would you like it? And they both reached reached out back to me, which I was surprised because they don't know me, just an unsolicited email. And that's how I started it. And that's how I, I you know, I met Ron, I got to know Ron and what he was doing. And, and uh, he's a brilliant attorney, as you know, you've interviewed him. 
And he was, you know, a freedom fighter fighting these this vaccine passport mandate for New York. And Todd Callender was doing it for the military. And so I filed in as amicus curiae in Todd's case. And uh, his case is now in the 10th Circuit. It's on appeal. And then I reached out to other attorneys because I was looking at the way these military plaintiffs uh, were approaching this mandate. And they were saying that the product's unlicensed, so you can't mandate it. So the military can actually mandate licensed products. They can't mandate it if it's under emergency use, unless the Secretary of Defense gets a waiver from the president, which he didn't do. And so a lot of the military cases were uh, filed under the Religious Freedom Act, uh, Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. But these ones, Todd's case and others, where I filed as amicus curiae, were filed pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act, where they were going for the jugular, the nucleus. They're basically saying, look, we're not opposed to taking the shots. We're just not going to take the unlicensed one. And so they were actually attacking the core issue because if you look at the way these mandates were enacted, the Secretary of Health and Human Services did uh, an emergency, emergency declaration under the PREP Act, where basically it says, these are countermeasures and recommended activities. So how do you go from a recommended activity to mandating? To, you know, like for anybody, whether it's military or for physicians working in a hospital or for someone working in a tech company, these are recommended activities. So it, that's how it started. And I filed basically information to the court that would warrant uh, notice to the court for facts that may have been overlooked or things that would help uh, the military plaintiffs. And, you know, I saw what was happening to them. I read their affidavits and I saw that they were just being railroaded by the system. And I respect, you know, the military. I'm not from military, but I just respect the people that, that they don't, that serve in the military. So I think this was my way to serve the military. Since I have not served in the military, this is my way that I'm going to serve the military. And you know, I'm not getting paid. It's not, you know, I'm not, I don't have any fee agreements with the attorneys. It's, I just do this on my own because I felt it was very important because, you know, these uh, military members were getting discharged by the thousands. And to me, that was a national security issue because we're not gutting the military. You know, and for what? This is based on a scam. And, you know, there was a document which, which nobody had until later but the FDA, when they granted the marketing right, of Comirnaty, which is the Pfizer licensed product, it's actually BioNTech's product, they actually terminated that on the same day. And no one knew that, right? So the television was telling everyone it's safe, it's safe, you know, it's effective, it's safe and effective, FDA approved. But the, but the FDA terminated that product. So how can it be mandated? And the DOD created the mandate the next day. So the mandate was, was you know, was basically, in my opinion, unlawful from the beginning, but that has to be ruled on by a court. And I think what's happened is, and as we've seen over the last two years in all this litigation, it's very difficult to fight the system. They're not litigating against the Department of Defense or the FDA, they're litigating against the system, right? And, and the system is based on the narrative that's been conveyed by the government. And so going against that narrative is very difficult, even for the people that are in the military. And, you know, as Todd Callender said and wrote in the 10th Circuit, these are some of the finest uh, members of society, you know, and this is what's happening to them. It's, 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 uh, it's appalling. So that, that's just what I, I just felt, you know what, I have flexible schedule. I'm going to, I'm going to do my research and I'm going to do whatever I can, you know, to help them. So. Bravo. But don't you get dejected sometimes? I mean, aren't you overwhelmed? You know, this is a pretty beast, pretty big beast we're trying to tame here. Um, how do you handle the times and you're like, what am I doing here? Excellent question. Uh, you're absolutely right. So, you know, a lot of these cases now are being dismissed because Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act, which ordered the Secretary of Defense to rescind the mandate. Uh, which was done in January of this year. And, um, and so, you know, again, that was a contract because Congress gives the Department of Defense money for the fiscal budget for the military. It was like $800 billion or something. And in that, they wrote a one paragraph uh, sentence saying, you shall rescind the mandate within 30 days, which is what the Secretary of Defense did. But a lot of people still have negative remarks 
on their personnel records. Um, they were demoted. They lost pay. Um, you know, I had to learn all this lingo about militaries. I didn't, you know, I don't know the stuff that they were getting. This goal more, you know, the general officer, uh, you know, they're being reprimanded and having all these things in their files. And so, um, you know, that has to be corrected because it's been rescinded. And as we know from insurance, when you rescind a contract, you bring everyone back to the beginning as if it, nothing happened. So yes, it's very, um, sometimes you feel like, wow, all this work, and all of a sudden the case gets dismissed. But on the flip side, on the positive side, you know, because of the pushback and because of the action taken by the military members and by, um, you know, the council, um, you know, it was rescinded. And so I think it, everything helped, right? People contacting their Congress uh, members, people filing, uh, filing whistleblower, uh, whistleblower affidavits, uh, people filing FOIA requests, you know, uh, everything helped. And in one of the cases uh, in South Carolina, where the case was dismissed as moot, not on the merits, but the, you know, the judge dismissed it, but the Department of, of Defense decided to remove all the negative remarks and reinstate the, the, the cadets from the Coast Guard that were, that were kicked out, that were discharged. So it's not all for naught, right? But you know, when, they, when the Department of Justice came back with a very aggressive filing in a, in a Texas case, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, it's just because I read the affidavits and if you, if people really knew what was happening to the members of the armed forces, I mean, there's day, there's nights where I can't sleep because I see what they're going through. I'm like, I can't imagine this. It's like, these are people that have given 15, 17, 20 years, you know, of service and they're just being treated this way. So it, yeah, it's, 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 it can be emotionally consuming and, um, you know, it can be physically daunting to want to actually go through the research and read the cases because, again, the courts are very strict. The way you file, you have to do it a certain way and, you know, with formatting and the fonts and the page limits and this. And you have to read all the rules for each judge and each court. Um, you have to get permission from the attorneys to file. And uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's like it, it took me five days usually to draft one of these. I'm not a lawyer, so I have to research everything myself. But when it's all said and done, it's on the docket, you know, and people can read it and the judge reads it. And um, I think that's, you know, it's a positive thing because it helps the case and it helps the plaintiffs. So um, I don't regret it. I don't regret spending the time or spending my own money doing it because it's just, uh, it's, it's for a good cause. Uh, you, it's, you sounds like you, you, you feel like you're part of something larger than you and that's for the good is that a good characterization I, that's very good yeah that's very accurate yes it's not about me i'm just one guy right and now there's so many people doing so many things right on so many levels um that uh it's just one thing and everything i think the collective consciousness now is creating a movement of awareness that's creating the change right people are not accepting these mandates people are rejecting the mandates people are you know are, are pushing back and that's that's a good thing you know but uh it was better if it was done sooner but you know it's, it is what it is right and i think it takes time for people to realize um what's really happening and what's at stake so could you relate to the idea that things happen for a reason and things happen when they're supposed to happen and because it didn't happen yesterday means it wasn't intended to happen yesterday. Can you yeah, take that outlook? I would, I, I would agree with that, yes. I think that the universe is balanced and this is like a good versus evil thing. And maybe at some point the evil was in power and then, but since most people are good, the good is gonna overcome it. So that's the way I, I approach it. That even if there's gonna be bad things happening, the good will overcome it. So, and uh, you know, eventually this is like a, I look at it as a pyramid of lies, okay? There's a pyramid of lies and there's a foundation lie. And if you keep cracking the foundation, okay, the pyramid of lies collapses. And once it does, the only thing left to see is the truth, right? And they say the truth will set you free, right? So that's all it is. It's about ascending in truth. And as long as you're on that path, you can't worry about how long it'll take or the outcome or whatever. Like you mentioned in the earlier call we had, it's like, there's always gonna be other cases, right? There's always going to be a case, always going to be another ruling. 
So, you know, even if these cases get mooted, there's another one. In fact, I just read one yesterday from a nurse that sued uh, the hospital in Houston. Uh, it's called Bridges versus Houston Methodist. Very well drafted complaint. Um, and it's so detailed. And all it talks about is, look, this is informed consent. You have to have informed consent. If you want to give somebody a product that's uh, experimental, you have to give them informed consent or otherwise you're violating their informed consent, right? If we sign a policy with our clients, we have to give them full and fair disclosure and get their consent because that binds the contract. And so there's going to be other cases like that because they're going to be, there's no way that this truth is not going to be uh, suppressed forever, right? It's like a beach ball. You push it under the water. Yeah, it may stay there for a little while. As soon as you let go, what happens? Rises to the surface. Push it down again. How long are you going to hold it there for? Rises to the surface. So you're not going to stop these uh, uh, people from exposing what's happened. You know, people that lost their livelihoods, that lost it all, right? They're going to. I think the. I think the American public is very resilient. I think you can't. You can't just keep. You know, trying to deceive them. They're going to push back, and they are. So that's what makes this country great. You know, we're not the communist model so far. You know, we, we still have some, you know, some rights, some freedoms, you know, but we're going down a very dangerous path because this, this COVID thing is just a small snippet of it, right? If you, if you know about the agenda, then it's about the, you know, the social credit system, you know, the digital identifications. Um, I read a, a document, this is on whitehouse.gov, about the G20 summit in Bali last year. And they had 23 declarations. And one of them was a digital identification certificate for vaccine passports. So that's still in the works. It's just because the pushback of stuff like what Ron, Ron Brewery did in New York, you know, five days before he filed, um, he filed appeal in the circuit court, second circuit, I was following his case. And five days before his, his oral arguments, the mayor rescinded it. Oh, your case is moot now. There's nothing to discuss. <laughs> so, so there, are, there is, you know, there, there is pushback, right? And so, I think that's that's that has to. You have to keep still be vigilant. Don't let your guard down and think, oh, okay, it's over now. My mandates are over. Well, actually, the Secretary of HHS still extended the EUA. It's still in place. The federal emergency might be over, but the determination of of the emergency is still there, because the COVID shots are, are on the CDC schedule, the immunization schedule for 2023. But if you read the fine print, they're on the schedule pursuant to the EUA, which means if you get injured, you can't sue and get compensatory damages and the attorneys can't get their fees. This was something I didn't know, but then I looked up uh, vaccine injury lawyer uh, on Google and I just called a couple of vaccine injury lawyers because they they specialize in in helping people who have been damaged not just by the COVID shot but any shot and I asked them so how many filings have you made pursuant to the COVID shot like well none I'm like what this we can't get damages because for that it has to be on the schedule and it has to be licensed and I just looked in the HHS website before we talk and they have a they have, they have like a sort of a spreadsheet that shows the difference between the countermeasures injury compensation program, which applies to unlicensed products, and the national vaccine injury compensation program, which applies to licensed products. And it, it clearly says on there. Uh, in fact, the actual document says, uh, for a category of vaccines to be covered by the national vaccine injury compensation program, the category of vaccines must be recommended for routine, for routine administration to children and or pregnant women uh, by the CDC, subject to an excise tax by federal law and added to the vaccine injury table by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. This has not been done for any U.S. licensed COVID-19 vaccines, which have not been developed to date. This is from the HHS website. So when we've been told the last two years, safe and effective, FDA approved, it's just, it's just a lie. And the whole thing's a scam. So that, you know, that's just, I mean, it's just incredible. But the information is right there. It's not, you don't have to go to any, you know, conspiracy theory website. This is the HHS website. So that's, you know, what, what are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. And I think we'll wrap it up this way. 
Kriddish, the what you're going to do is you're going to pursue the truth like you are. You're a role model for, for, for people to follow in pursuing the truth. And, and not only will it set you free, as you mentioned earlier, but it will keep you strong. And um, there's a saying of right makes might. And I think that that really encapsulates what you're about. And, um, and I think it's the kind of thing that will sustain you. This will be a long battle. And I have every confidence that it will sustain you. And um, I want to thank you for sharing your strength with us and your perseverance and your, your total commitment to the truth, because I, I know that will inspire many, many people that read your commentary and hear this interview. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm really happy to be here. All right. We'll keep in touch. All righty. Okay.